Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simon Eisenbach, as I'm sure you guys could tell from everything online. Um, give you guys a quick background. I was born and raised in New Hartford. I graduated from New Hartford High School in 2006, graduate of MVCC in 2008, and graduate of Nyack College in 2010. I do nothing that I went to college for. If that makes you guys feel more assured about being in college. That being said, MV is a great way to start your college experience. Um, what we're going to dig into, oh, and now I own a commercial photography and video production company. I have worked on four continents, including North America. So I've been around the block a little bit. Uh, today we're going to talk about what? Come on. There we go. What this, our good old city of Utica, has to do with this. A little village called Nibobongo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what this type of work here, working with large nonprofits and corporate businesses in this area has to do with this in the most remote places in the world. Um, this all started back in the time before I had even touched a camera. I don't have a past like a lot of people that do photography and filmmaking. I didn't grow up in it. I don't have any family history. I didn't pick up a camera until I was actually a senior in college. And the only reason I did that was because of school. But in 2007, I went to Burkina Faso, West Africa for the first time. I was on a team of seven people working on doing electrical for a high powered bit of stuff that was dealing with a library at a school. And that opportunity opened my eyes to what actually happens in a lot of this world. Um, th it's insane how different life is in a developing country versus here. Um, yes, I did actually sit on a crock. Um, I've also laid down with tigers and all this other crazy stuff. People question my sanity a lot of the time. But fast forward a couple of years to my senior year of college. This is the only photo I could find from college. I had to take an elective, and the only one that fit in my schedule because of athletics was intro to digital photography. If I had known then what the future would turn out to be, I probably would have actually taken it a little more seriously, but that is what it is. Um, after I graduated college in 2010, I decided to go the typical route of get a job that pays bills because you've got loans to pay. And I worked for my dad's engineering firm dealing with asbestos. It's not glamorous, but it pays really, really well. Uh, I was able to pay off my loans in about a year and a half, and then I decided I was sick of it, and I actually moved halfway around the world to Taiwan for six and a half months. Um, the reason I moved to Taiwan was because I had an opportunity to work with a church plant slash coffee shop startup in Ximending, Taipei, which is a, the former red light district of Taipei, but is now a up and coming vibrant youth centered part of the city. Uh, I did various photo, video, media marketing, that kind of stuff. And I lived there for six and a half months in 2012. Uh, when I came home from Taiwan, I landed a week before Hurricane Sandy hit. And I actually got stuck in New York City during Hurricane Sandy because I stayed down there for a photo trade show. And let me tell you, that was uh, interesting, to say the least. Um, that also opened the door because I, by the time I actually got home and settled, I was given the opportunity by my dad who was going back to Burkina Faso to accompany him because he needed someone to fly with him to help with some things that he needed there. So that trip, originally we were supposed to do something completely different than what happened. But when we were in the air flying to Burkina Faso, the family we were supposed to be working with actually had a death in their family in the US and ended up having to fly home. So we actually crossed paths in the air, and we ended up working with a lot of different people than we had originally planned. But what did open up in that opportunity was we got to see a lot more of what they were doing project-wise in Burkina Faso. And 
that let us see more of what positive is actually happening. That also gave us the opportunity to see a couple things that I think are pretty mind blowing. I still am trying to figure out how this kid's actually riding this bike. <coughs> um, I, there's only one size of bike, so if you want to get around not walking, you figure it out. Um, this photo along with this photo are the reason why I have a company as we know it today. Um, I, these two photos along with time sleeping under the stars gave me some time for self-reflection and also to talk with the people that work for the nonprofit about what their biggest pain points and biggest struggles are as a nonprofit operating in the developing world. Biggest problem, fundraising. What's their second biggest problem? They can't increase their ability to do fundraising because they don't have decent material to go and tell people and show people what's going on. We live in a digital age where you're bombarded with billions of photos every day. And it's insane how all of that photo video content is increasing in quantity and it's all just being slammed in your face. So in order for these nonprofits to stand out, they have to have top notch photo and video, which on a small nonprofit budget doesn't necessarily happen. So that was where I decided to start the company so I could do more of this type of work. And this also gave me the opportunity to go back a couple months later and work on a well drilling rig. To give you guys an idea, this time of year it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit out and we're working on a literal like truck, steel, everything. So it was a little bit warm. Uh, but we were able to drill six wells in two weeks, which is a phenomenal rate uh, because you can only drill about 10 feet in an hour and the average well is about 250 to 300 feet deep. Um, all the while I was documenting this process. So this was kind of the start and where I started to work with the organizations and understand where they could really benefit and at the same time also be able to figure out what's going to help them in the future and also where they saw the need um, which is really interesting because you taking what they see as a need and what can have a positive change here are two very different things uh, that also opened the door in 2014 to go back and work with my father who was helping install a solar powered water pump system that fed a garden at a school which the garden took a school from barely surviving and barely being able to feed themselves to in one year the garden grew six times and they were actually selling crops to the local village in their market. So they went from barely scraping to thriving and actually being able to generate profit out of the school so that they could then help get more students into the school by being able to lower tuition. Um, every student at the school has to work in the garden as part of their education. Um, this gives you a little bit of an idea of what it, the system looks like. It now has actually doubled in size because they found that if they added another tank to it, they were able to double what they were able to put out and they did that about a year after. Um, this is the garden at the time of installation, so you can imagine how much different it looks now. This led me to one of the most unforgettable moments in my life. This photo may not look like much, but I had just taught these two young women how to use a faucet. How many of you guys remember when you learned how to use a faucet? And they were, I think, 19 and 21. So. Be, being an American that's used to every luxury at home, having a situation where you're teaching someone that's not that much younger than you how to use a faucet will stick with you forever. Um, and the sheer amount of joy on these young women's faces when I did teach them, it was like I couldn't wipe the smile as they were walking back to their, uh, their homes or whatever. They have like rooms in a building. Uh, dorm room, I guess you could call it. Um, now, this is all fun, but it's not very glamorous. This is what it's like working in these kinds of situations. Um, 
lots of dust, lots of dirt, and you're cleaning stuff all the time. So many, many long days and lots of sending stuff off for repair when you get home. But on the plus side, you get to have some fun. So we've gotten to see a few animals. Um, to give you guys an idea, I was 15 feet away from this on the top of a Jeep, and I was seeing it eye to eye. So not small animals. Um, that brings me to how am I able to sustain? Well, when I first started the company, my goal was to only work with nonprofits in the developing world. Problem that I realized very quickly is they don't even have money to send me over, never mind actually make it so I can make a living. <coughs> so I started the production company here in Utica, and I decided Utica, A, because of my low cost of living. Uh, when I first started the company, I lived in an apartment in East Utica with two other guys, and I paid 200 bucks a month for rent. You're never going to get anywhere close to that going to a big city. Uh, yes, I could have had b different working opportunities in New York City or a big city, but you can't beat 200 bucks a month in rent. Also, I had connections here. Having that kind of built-in network to start was crucial for me getting off the ground. Granted, starting a business takes a lot of time, especially in the photo video world, where you have a ton, a ton of competition. That being said, I found three areas that I, A, did really well and found a client base that was able to help me grow. The first one is real estate. I do a lot of real estate photography in this area for various realtors. I've shot everything from a $40,000 house up to the stairwell on the left came out of, or yep, on the left, came out of a $2.5 million house in East Utica. So it's been, all across the spectrum and I've seen things that I wish I'd never seen and I've seen things that you just kind of wonder how someone can actually afford that. Um, I also do a lot with large nonprofits. I do a ton of work with Griffiths Institute and the Greater Utica Chamber and uh, the Community Foundation and basically what I do is I help them tell people about what they're actually doing. Lastly, economic development. Who can guess where that is? Or what that giant hole is? That is Marcy Nano Center. Or what will be Marcy Nano Center. To give you guys an idea, this small dot right here is a six foot tall person. It's a 300,000 cubic yard hole, and that <coughs> excavator right there can fill a dump truck in two scoops. They were running 500 dump trucks a day out of Marcy Nano Center for like four months. Um, and the cool thing with this is I get to see what's going to happen in the future of our area. Um, I love working with these types of companies because I get to be on the cutting edge with things like Quad C, where Dan Foss will be moving in sometime in the next year. But photo only gets so far, again, so the majority of where the company is going is actually in the video world. I previously mentioned working with the Community Foundation, and last fall I worked with them and a local ad agency to create this TV commercial, which aired the day after the election for a very specific reason. To be humble, to be kind, it is a giving of peace in your mind. To a stranger, to a friend To give in such a way that has no end We are love, we are one We are how we treat each other and nothing more Now, part of why I love working with companies like the Community Foundation 
is they had a vision for where the company as a whole wanted to go. Um, one of the things I've found as I've sort of narrowed my client base um, is that companies that have a vision for here's where we want to be are a whole lot easier to work with than companies that say we want a 30 second commercial. Because if someone comes to you and says we just want a 30 second commercial, you say, what are you trying to sell? What are you, who are you trying to target and so on. But if you have someone like the Community Foundation that said, people don't know exactly what we do, people don't know who we work with, we want to showcase what we work with. That's what we came up with. We also wanted to talk about community growth because everything the Community Foundation does stays within Herkimer and Oneida counties. They have an insane reach into things that I didn't even realize until we were actually doing this commercial. Uh, part of that is also we will go to any length to achieve shots. So part of that was me having to ride a bike while holding a camera perfectly stable. Um, it's not, not easy, but keeps things interesting. Also, putting cameras in many funky places. And lastly, getting really unique shots. And that's another thing that I have kind of evolved with is I actually have also started tapping into the world of being an inventor. Um, in the summer of 2015, I wanted to figure out how to move a camera while capturing time lapse in a certain route. And with that, I realized there was nothing on the market for it. So I invented it. I took parts from three different companies and built custom brackets to put them all together. Um, this will hopefully be going to market sometime next year. Um, and here is a prime example of it. Now, all of this is well and good, but one thing I still get is, well, you can leave if you're with all of this, but I don't want to leave. Utica is actually a place that people don't realize how much business happens here. Um, a lot of people say that businesses don't, there's no real big business, but there actually is. Um, prime example, I'm just going to call out, I'll call you out because I see your jacket, ECR International. Who knows what ECR International does besides him? What do they do? They make uh, air conditioning equipment. Exactly. You would never know that a major HVAC supplier <coughs> is here in Utica. So there's a lot of companies that I can work with and still make a living here in Utica. There's a lot of companies that have the opportunity and they have the forethought to grow but here in Utica. Um, the only way to get Utica to turn around and have Utica grow into a thriving city is to stay in Utica. Um, that being said, at the end of last year, I actually purchased an office building, um, kind of helping establish my roots. One of the things I've also found with w trying to find a space was that my space had to be tailored to the specific group of people that I work with and want to work with. One thing I find with a lot of businesses and a lot of creatives in this area is they think if they want to expand their business that they have to offer more services. But the reality is that actually will hurt you in the long run. So over my four years in business, I've actually started to narrow in the types of clients I work with and I say no and I will pass off work to other people. The reason for that is because for me to be able to make a profit and grow, I have to be able to provide more value to my client. So the more value that I can provide to my client, the more I can charge them. It's a wonderful thing. But 
let's say you're trying to do all this other stuff, you're not as good as what you do, or not as good as at what you do. So kind of honing in and being, here's, the best, here's what I'm the best at, and here's what I'm going to do, and here's how I'm going to help you, helps grow a more sustainable business in the service industry where essentially what you're doing most of the time is trading time for money, but if you can trade value for money, you can be more valuable. Um, and with the office, I wanted it to be a little bit cutting edge, but still be low key in our area. So we decided to get a little funky. Um, again, trying to keep everything local. I had two local artists come in and create this mural because I want my clients to feel comfortable and just feel like it's this cool environment that they can come in and enjoy and be a part of the process. Trying to help someone have the best experience possible is what I have found to be one of my, I guess, selling points because <coughs> being in the service, it's all about me. I hate saying it, but that's, that's what it is because people are essentially buying me and my thoughts and my experience. So that leads back into going overseas. At the end of 2016, this conversation started actually in 2015. I was talking with an organization called E4 Project. They are out of Colorado somewhere. And this is where things get really funky and really start to mesh. And what E4 Project does is they work with people in developing countries to help grow what they do. We talked about this grand scheme. We were going to go to the Congo in January. And <coughs> in true African fashion, all of that fell through for the time being when we had visa issues coming out of the capital. So going back to the foundation, they gave me the opportunity to do something really funky for them that goes along the lines of helping build business while or um, helping people. So how many of you guys have heard of the root farm? The Root Farm is a nonprofit in Sukhoi that works with uh, UCP. And UCP works, uses their facility to do things like horseback riding for people with autism. They are now starting to have people work there to do stuff with what uh, these are called freight farms. And it's basically a self contained hydroponic unit that can grow 400 heads of lettuce a day. Excuse me. So. The whole point of this was to show people, again, what's going on. But also, they are using this to go to restaurants and things like that and say, hey, here's what this product is. And the product's amazing. Like the lettuce that comes out of there, as weird as it sounds, I think it tastes better than what you can get at the grocery store. But they are now growing it and selling it to local area. Um, and social enterprise is something that is huge for my thought process of how companies and nonprofits can grow. So going back into the Congo, E4 Project was it finally able to get us our visas in the beginning of February, which then meant we had to rush because we had 90 days to get in and out of the country. Dealing with developing countries can be very tricky, and you just kind of say OK a lot of the time. Um, perfect example, we found out when we got there that we had to pay $500 deposit for them to, to ensure our camera equipment left the country. And when we left, they conveniently took 50 bucks out because it was their fee. That's just things that happen. Um, but what we were doing is we were working to create a series of marketing materials that will be used over the next five years. Um, in eight days in the country, we shot a terabyte and a half worth of data and we were able to shoot video for a minimum of nine videos. We probably have enough content we could make 15 to 20 uh, for various topics that we will go a little bit further into detail. Uh, 
as we continue, including they are starting a coffee plantation, they are starting a pig farm, they're trying to fundraise to get a new truck because you will see shortly how bad their roads are. Um, also, a new school for the elementary kids and other stuff involving the hospital because this hospital is so remote that there's no running water. Um, yeah. And I showed people that work at hospitals here some of the photos and they were like in disbelief that this was actually a hospital. Mind you, it's the best hospital in the entire region of the country. Um, so here's kind of a glimpse into what it took to pull off this. Mind you, when we go over and do these kinds of projects, I bring every tool that I use in the US. So basically all the skills and tools that I like learn and use here, I take the full package and bring it over with me. So they are getting the exact same type of product that I would be providing to someone here. Maybe not certain lighting and stuff like that that's big and heavy because we had a ton of bag weight restrictions on this trip, but we bring basically everything we can. Let's just say it was better me than you. What was that about? So I got randomly selected for a more in-depth search. And so I had to power on and off every camera. I had to then power on my laptop. I had to power on my phone. Then they had to swab all of my equipment, all of my bags, and all of me. See him swimming around? Dude, it's like, what's our issue? National Geographic in here. The, the problem is all of these little things from this big bucket are swimming around in here. I'm supposed to wash my hands and bathe with it. What goes into this whole shindig? Okay, so the party tomorrow, so far, from what I've seen, uh, they've had the elementary school uh, carry in loads and loads and loads of firewood. They, they canceled school for They this. canceled school today so they could What's gather the palm branches for the canopy that they've set up. Uh, they've enlisted 40 women to do the cooking. And they've got like hundreds of pounds of plantains and rice and they've butchered one cow, two pigs, and 16 chickens uh, to, to be able to feed the crowd tomorrow. So, yeah, it's getting nuts.
that giant celebration was because they actually just finished construction of a brand new pediatric building, which is the first two-story bu building in that whole area. All the equipment was actually shipped and donated by a hospital on the West Coast. Could any of you guys guess how much it cost to get the shipping container there? Million. Not, not that high. Let me, I'm, it's more than your car probably. It cost $60,000 to get a shipping container from California to the village. Mind you, it only cost 15 to get it to the continent. It cost $45,000 to get it across two countries and into it. Um, it's insane how bad the roads are. But one of the things we found interesting was our work, no matter what, was always cut out for us. Anytime we would put a drone in the air, everyone would leave whatever building they were in. So if we wanted to get a shot where we didn't have people, we had about 45 seconds by the, from the time we put the drone in the air to get the shot. It's not much time when you're trying to get the drone up. Uh, we were trying to fly around 1,000 to 1,500 feet because they didn't have any flight restrictions and were able to get it looking a little bit more grand. Um, but it takes about that same amount of time to get it up in the air. That being said, the kids were in awe, and it was hilarious seeing kids' reactions to what was going on. Also, everything was running guns. So we were always having whatever we needed on us. Um, we were in the most obscure locations shooting interviews. Um, I think we shot 17 different interviews in the time frame. Also, we got to be literally less than three feet from an operation. They were actually removing a prostate while we were in that room. And the guy was awake. <sighs> um, ask anyone that works in a hospital, this would never, ever come even close. Never mind the fact that these are windows that would not pass in the US because you wouldn't have a sterile environment. But this is about as sterile as it gets. Also, the suction machine is from 1950 because every time they try and send a new one over, it breaks within a year. And that one, for some reason, still works. But it sucks a ton of power. And everything at the hospital is actually run on solar. Um, so it, that actually has its like own setup. Um, everything is either solar or gas powered. And gas is $22 a gallon there. Imagine if you guys had to pay 22 bucks a gallon to drive anywhere. But the village also only has three cars in it. Everything else is moto or people walk. And people don't travel nearly as much distance-wise. Uh, like I was saying, they're also trying to start a pig farm. And these two gentlemen are basically the masterminds of their pig farming program. <coughs> this guy right here is Pastor Ikabu. And 10 years ago, he bought a 1,000-acre coffee plantation off of Greek farmers that had left during all the wars for dirt cheap because he knew in the future it could be useful. And I forget his name, but he is the guy who basically runs the entire property. Uh, mind you, random people live on their property. Like, property over there isn't what you think of it here. Like, people just kind of build their little mud huts and stay wherever. <coughs> but they are the people who are behind both the pig farm and then the coffee plantation that will be starting over the next three years. Um, these are some coffee beans, which is one of the largest crops in that area. The hardest part is trying to export though. Uh, right now, they are working together with a few different organizations to in three years, start exporting as like a cumulative group um, because that gives enough quantity for someone outside to want to come in to get the stuff out because trying to get stuff out of that country is extremely difficult just because of the amount of time it takes to get it there. And one of those groups is actually the Catholic Church with these twin brothers that are from Belgium, I believe, and they have lived there for 47 years. They've lived more than half their lives over there. Going back to the hospital, this pediatric building is becoming closer to American standards.
when I say closer is it will never actually get there because they will never have running water. But they just got these incubators which will allow them to save more premature babies and be able to get closer to what we would call an acceptable um, living percentage of birth, or birth survival rate. Um, there is a hospital in Mali that my family has worked with that has a 96% survival rate. Um, so it is possible, it just takes time. They are in year four of a 10 year master plan to actually get up to the standards they wanna be. And this master plan was developed completely by the Congolese. So basically everything E4 is working towards was masterminded by Congolese people. Um, basically what I'm doing is helping egg them along. This is what their current schools look like. Imagine if this was your classroom. No laptops, no smart boards. But <coughs> what they're trying to do is bring it up and they are in the process of building a brand new school that is made out of bricks. And one of the things that they were trying to do is get it built very, very quickly because they had part of the funds but they needed to finish it off. And I was just talking with the organization and they are waiting to hear back from a group that did a 5K this past weekend and they may have the roof fully funded and it's been a month almost exactly since we got back. It's only been two weeks since they started the fundraising campaign for this school roof. So that goes to a little bit of a testimony of how having quality media can help. And the video that I'm about to play was developed basically on the airplane to try and help them get to this goal. On site at the new school for Nibabongo. This is going to be a, a primary school, so like K through 5 uh, in our American system. Uh, you can see that the current uh, buildings are there, so this is going to be a massive upgrade. And uh, they're using this cool uh, brick technology uh, that we help them import from Uganda. And it actually, all these blocks interlock to each other, so the building goes really fast and they don't need mortar. Uh, which actually brought the cost of this structure down by like 30%. Um, so what's happening now is that this team, uh, they finished the pediatric ward, so now they're full force on this school, and they're working way faster than uh, we were expecting. And so by April, uh, they are going to be ahead of us from a uh, fundraising perspective. Uh, and it's important not to leave these bricks uh, exposed uh, to the rain for too long. So uh, we need like 10 grand in like a month <laughs> to be able to keep up with this crew because uh, they're moving really fast, uh, but they're also uh, doing things uh, very uh, meticulously, paying a lot of attention to detail. I mean, everything's square. Uh, it's just, it's beautiful. So in two weeks, in actually in five minutes after Dan, who is the only full-time staff member of the org, within five minutes of him debuting this at a presentation, he had half the funding. A week and a half later, he had another quarter and he's waiting on the 5K to find out if they're fully funded. It's pretty incredible what can be done. And the reason why the guy who came up right away donated was because he actually saw the impact that his money could have. Um, putting, putting the visual to the story helps put so much, so much in perspective. Uh, there's a business guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, who says, document, don't create. And it's so true because all we did was told exactly what's going on. And it showed people exactly, exactly what's going on and people bought in. Um, what will be coming up next is an interesting bit of fun for us. This was probably one of the most fun videos for us to create. Um, over there, like I said, the roads are kind of bad. Does anyone in here drive stick shift? How, how often do you get up into fifth gear? Pretty regularly, right? In eight days there, we never went into fifth gear. We only went into fourth gear six times because you just can't go fast enough to get up into that type of speed. Um, so this nice, beautiful truck is actually not the hospitals. Um, getting through these roads is not actually very easy. 
And one of the things that the hospital found was that their current 1982 Land Rover that had a tree growing through it at one point just wasn't going to cut it for the future. So what we did was we had some fun with high speed and drones to give them something. Here we have a Land Cruiser 2017 Series 79. This car is the ideal car for the roads in and around Nebobongo. Around here we've got rock crawling, we've got mudding, we've got long distance endurance, and we have uh, no maintenance shops for quite a while. So what makes this so perfect is the ground clearance. We've got some good tires, locking differentials, four wheel drive. Inside under the hood we have a straight six diesel engine with zero computers that can get wet and that cause problems. So this vehicle was engineered by Toyota for use in areas like this and it has uh, very few parts that can break. It's over engineered and it's exactly what they need. problem is this car is not ours this one is so this car is a 1982 Land Rover Defender uh, it is a legendary car in its own right but this one in particular it's a little tired uh, currently there's a transmission problem so it is stuck they have to pull the transmission take it to a town 30 miles away to get fixed uh, it's not going to be reliable for the future and we need a good Land Cruiser to be uh, moving cement around, people, most importantly medication uh, to support the functioning of the hospital. So, uh, old Land Rover Defender, this is the car of the past, Land Cruiser Series 79, the car of the future. As you can see, it's quite not fun over there. Um, the mud on those roads was just two days worth of rain. Their rainy season is seven months long. So imagine trying to get around in four months where it's just been barded with rain every single day. And one of the days we actually saw dime-sized hail, which was actually very painful when you're in the middle of a field. So it's a little bit about me, what I do, and how building a business here in Utica allows me to impact the world in my own unique way. Do you guys have any questions? Yes? Why isn't that car legal in the USA? So that car is not legal in the USA because you have to have electronics and a catalytic converter. That car is so stripped down that you could actually open the hood and hose out the engine bay. And so a lot of the emissions requirements that you have to fit to come into the US, it does not even come close. But the thing will last for 30 years and you can take it apart with four wrenches. <laughs> That's, trust me, if I could get one, I would have one too. Any other questions? Yes? So your host, while you're there, is before, right? My host was actually the hospital. The hospital is its own business. Then E4 is like a support for them. I was working for E4 Project to create the materials for them to use. But I, a lot of my clients, what I do is I actually have more of a partner than just like a provider. So most of my clientele, I work with them to figure out, okay, here's your vision. Here's what we're going to make to help you get to that end goal. So it's a little bit different than, hey, we just want to make a video, but it gives a better end product. So I worked with E4 before we went and they said, here's the things we're trying to cover. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to try and capture if we can get it all done in time. 
and we had a list of XYZ, PDQ, whatever. So I work with E4, E4 works with the hospital. And, and to provide your accommodations, though, what are they like? You know, the basic sleeping needs. Um, so the sleeping was, uh, I'll just, one second and I'll pull it up. So our sleeping was actually not too bad. I just got to get to the right folder. Um, basically, what we were staying in was a house. Um, it used to be, there used to be a pilot stationed at the hospital, but in, I forget what year he actually came back to the US. So there was an empty house that they let us stay in. Um, gosh. All right, so here's the top-down view of the hospital. So right here is the house we stayed in. And it's nothing fancy. You've got beds with mosquito nets. You've got a living room. You've got a dining room. No one actually cooks inside houses there, so you don't really need a kitchen. Ours, because it was foreigners, it did have a kitchen. Um, the one thing that's interesting is a lot of time fridges will be outside because they're kerosene fridges. Um, they are starting to get solar powered ones, but they're still really expensive. But right here is the runway that dropped us off. So when the plane landed, we were 25 yards from our house. Um, and that's an, when we went in, we were on an 11 seat plane. When we were going out, we were on a six seat plane and we only had like 20 pounds between what we had and max load going out. And I was the fat guy on the plane. <coughs> Never in my life have I been called fat until that day. Um, but as far as food, the hospital director has a woman in the village that actually is like full-time staff, just does whatever the hospital needs. And she prepared three meals a day for us, did our laundry every day for us, and cleaned our house every day for us. So we had it pretty well. And it only cost us 15 bucks a day. It was pretty amazing. And what kind of food did you eat? Um, most of their food is a combination of 12 different ingredients. Potatoes, rice, plantains are their normal bases. If they're lucky, they'll get chicken or beef or pork. That doesn't happen all the time. They have a ton of spinach-like vegetables. They have manioc, which is a leafy thing that turns into this weird soup. I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, lots of peanut sauces, lots of tomato sauces. Um, it, basically what they do is they mix the varying ingredients to make food um, and not have to eat the same exact thing every single day. But one of the things they are doing is they are working, one of the programs they have is for malnutrition. Um, a lot of times they find that young mothers do not understand what will help their child grow the best. So they are working on training mothers, plus they're also providing a like porridge mix with the right ingredients to give the best proteins for children that, that are small. Yes. Two questions. With the seven months of rainy season, is it possible to wash out? I don't know the answer to that. I can ask. If you want to give me your information, I can email you or send you a message and <coughs> let you know. What, what did those two brothers do for 47 years? They were Catholic priests. Um, they ran, there used to be 10 brothers at the facility that they had, and they, at one point in the 80s, had a 120 acre coffee plantation that has since not been able to grow as much. And they used to do a ton of exports, but now they're actually starting to grow again for export in three to five years. Coffee plants take three years before they will actually like be able to provide a crop. So what they're doing right now is for three to five years down the road. Anything else? Yes. Um, if you want to contribute to what's going on in the DRC, e4project.org. If you want to contribute to what I'm doing, working with various organizations, um, shoot me an email and I can get you into the contact with the nonprofit that I'm on staff with. Anything else? Alrighty. Thank you guys for having me.